Hey everyone and welcome back to another Niagara tutorial. Today we'll be recreating this spark system. This would be ideal for things like bullet impacts and clashes of metal hitting metal. To get started we're going to create our Niagara emitter. We'll create this from a template and there's one that's almost resembling the final result that I've shown at the start and that's the directional burst. And whilst this looks like it will be pretty much everything that we need bar a change of colour, this is still going to provide us a good opportunity to explore a lot of new particle components and also add our own finishing touches. So rename this and I've gone for NE for Niagara Emitter, then underscore Sparks. It's been a little bit hard so far to find a naming convention for the, uh, the new system as it seems to differ even in the engine examples. I stumbled across this one though, it seems like it might be the one going forward and this is what I'll be sticking to in future content. Inside of the emitter, I'll go straight down to the playback time and I'll set this to the full length of the effect to remove any kind of dead update time here. And that's actually looking a little bit too fast. So let's go to the emitter update and change the loop duration to two seconds. And then whilst in the emitter update, the sparks are also looking a little bit too uniform. So we'll use the drop down to the right and change this to a uniform range of type integer and set the values between 35 and 65. This just means that each time a new burst is spawned, it will be a slightly different size based on the number of particle instances spawned in that burst. Next, under the particle spawn section, we'll check the initialize properties. The lifetime and mass are already set to a random floating range as well, which is really cool here, as that will probably look better than having the same lifetime and mass for both of these. We will be returning to the color a little bit later, so the only other thing that we want to change here is the sprite size. So first we want to control the X and the Y axis at the same time, so we're gonna keep these uniform. And to do this, we'll just create a vector 2D from float. And then we'll add some randomness to this by setting the minimum scale to two and the maximum scale to 10. Then we don't need the calculate size and rotation inertia by mass component. This is currently responsible for making the particles look thinner based on the direction that they move and we'll be controlling this another way in just a moment. We will be keeping the add velocity in the cone but we'll change some of the values here to get a slightly wider arc. So for the strength I'll set this to a minimum of 100 and a maximum of 1000. And then for that slightly wider arc we're going to set the cone angle to a value of 90 and make sure that the axis values we have set to 1, 0, 1. And this will just apply the full force to the X and the Z axis and none on the Y. The final category we're going to focus on will be the particle update. The particle state and gravity we can leave as they are, as they just kill the particle at the end of its lifespan and the gravity is set to the default minus 980. We won't need the drag here so we can remove that component and we're also going to keep the scale by color but drive the actual color from the one selected in the spawn details to demonstrate some pretty cool effects in just a moment. So in the previous particle tutorial, I showed you how to make an emissive material using custom material instances. Another way that we can control the emissive value of a particle is to utilize the scale particle because this is a vector value rather than a linear color. So as a vector, we use the X, Y, and Z to control the red, green, and blue, but we can also increase this past the default range of zero to one Doing so will increase the emissive property. Then by increasing each of these to the same value, we can control the actual color of the particle under the emitter spawn details to the bright color that you want. However, the individual particles are still looking a little bit too round. So we can get control of this again by changing some of the details in the sprite size scale by velocity option. First, we'll remove the sample scale factor curve as we don't want this being quite so dynamic. We just want the sprite to be scale based on the direction it's moving, just to look as though it's kind of being stretched in distortion. So for the min scale factor, I'll set this to one on the X and 0.1 on the Y. Then for the max scale factor, I'll set this to one again on the X, but 10 on the Y. You can then see that this is now looking like a nice long spark rather than a blob. And another really important thing, which is set by default using this template is under the sprite renderer. So the alignment here is set to velocity aligned rather than the default unaligned. It's kind of difficult to demonstrate in this window because it seems like everything's uh, moving around every time the particle resets. But without being velocity aligned, the stretching can occur in the wrong direction, which can make it look as though a particle is being stretched on the Y axis, even though it's moving forward. So with all of those changes made though, we're now ready to apply, compile, and set the thumbnail of our emitter. If we then return to the Sparks emitter, we can right click on this and select to create a system from it. Rename the new system to NS underscore Sparks. And again, that's gonna be for Niagara system. 
Inside of our new system, I'm going to make a single change just to show an example of uh, setting user properties again. And one thing I also wanted to mention is a bug that seems to be in the current version. So if you wanted to create a new user variable for the color of the particle, for example, you should be able to go to the drop down and select make and then select the read from new user parameter. However, it seems that at the moment, if you click on this, the engine will just always crash. Just in case you see some tutorials or content from older examples where that wasn't an issue uh, and you run into that, just avoid that. Instead, what we want to do for the moment at least is go to the user exposed category, create a new parameter and select the color option. Rename this to sparks color and then in the initialize particle section, use the drop down and search user and then select the user option. So this is now linked our custom exposed parameter to the particle color controlling our sparks color and as we've not set anything in this this will default to white again we can use this blue node to the side though and set our color user parameter from here so with that done let's compile save and again create the thumbnail and then if we return to our map we can now drag this in and test the results so i'm using the force solo option here to make it play and with the particle selected we can see our exposed color parameter meaning that we can now easily update our user color value outside of the particle editor. One thing I think we could add to make this just look a little bit more interesting is collision. So let's go back into the emitter, press the plus icon on the update category and search collision. Select the collision option and notice that you get some error warnings here to the side. Just click on fix and this is because the collision is being handled after the force and velocity updates. Clicking fix will automatically correct the order of the components. And of course you can move the components around manually if you wanted. And there we go. So if we test this again, we now have the collisions on our particles with a really simple update. And it now is really starting to look like some kind of electrical explosion of sorts with sparks bouncing around. So just another very simple Niagara particle emitter there. Hopefully it's proven useful. The idea around these, especially as I'm not really in any way, I suppose an artist, or an effects artist especially. My main interest in these tutorials are trying to go through the components in the most logical way possible so that you can hopefully take that knowledge of what the components are doing, how we can set things up and implement those into your more than likely uh, better designed special effects and art collections that you'll be coming up with. So as always, if you did enjoy it though or find the video useful, please do leave a like and share the video around. That really helps the channel. It's greatly appreciated and will help more and more people find these hopefully useful tutorials. I try not to mention it too much, but the support over on Patreon again this month has just been amazing. So I just wanted to say another really big thank you to all the people supporting me over on Patreon. I think I'm trying something at the moment every week to try and improve the, the value that I can give back to you for supporting me there. So thank you for your patience. And again, to all the new people supporting, thank you for coming over and looking there. Of course, though, if you're unable to support the channel on Patreon, do consider subscribing. It will help you get updated with all of the latest content coming out on the channel. Also, be sure to hit the notification bell so that you get those updates. As ever, though, thanks for watching, and I will see you all next time.